This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Don. It's uh, good to see you this afternoon. Um, now, Don just mentioned the fact that I teach a couple of courses, including one called Practicum in Forest Farming. It's unusual. I think it's a unique course, at least in the sense that it's taught almost entirely outdoors at the McDaniels Nut Grove. Uh, the, the pictures here uh, are shots from the McDaniels Nut Grove, uh, some of the students that we've taught there over the last 12 years. And this fellow is Lawrence McDaniels, whose house Don now lives in. And used to. Oh, used to. I didn't yeah. know you moved. Uh. Anyway, um, Dr. Mack established, uh, the, well, came to Cornell in the 1920s. And uh, after he um, cut down all the trees on this particular site on the south edge of campus, um, he started planting nut trees. And even though his responsibility was primarily uh, pomology, apples, and so forth, he was really uh, dedicated to uh, temperate nut trees. And he and a few others in this country, like um, J.R. Smith, believed that uh, nut trees could become a very important source of food for livestock, as well as people, on steep hillsides. Um, it was a good idea as the uh, depression was approaching, but as things turned out, it didn't really uh, take off like they thought it might because of advances in modern agriculture, I think. Um, but So it was a variety trial, as I say, for temperate nut trees, uh, walnuts, hickories, and so forth. This was a clonal collection, so it was a clonal repository, and I think he learned a lot uh, about the trees and how they perform. and. Uh, how efficiently they could be grafted onto various rootstocks and so forth. Um, Dr. Mack retired in the mid-1950s, and it was about that time uh, when he um, was sort of phasing out his involvement in the, in the McDaniels nut grove. And uh, he was, was um, material in, in, um, in letting, letting go of that and, and turning on to other pursuits. But, in the meantime, since then, the, the site sort of reverted to uh, secondary forest. And we rediscovered it uh, overgrown with all sorts of invasives and everything else in about 2002. And ever since then, we've been developing it as an um, outdoor teaching site for forest farming. A um, couple hundred of students have passed through, and it's the students who have contributed a great deal of what you will see on the ground there now. Um, so at any rate, I and uh, Steve Gabriel, uh, who also uh, helps me teach the course, we spent a lot of time there. And to some extent, it was the McDaniels Nut Grove that inspired me uh, to, to write this book along with Steve. There we go. That's the book. Um, that's Steve Gabriel. I'm not here to sell you books today. Uh, but I would like to talk about some of the some of the things that we bring up in the book that I think are important opportunities for people who have uh, small woodlots and so forth. Now, let me tell you what forest farming is. Forest farming is one of a number of different um, agroforestry practices. Uh, forest farming, the one that's uh, penultimate in my mind, but also alley cropping, riparian buffers, windbreaks, silvopasture, those are supposed to be cows down there. and uh, forest gardening, which is distinctly different from forest farming. You can define forest farming as, uh, well, the simplest definition. This is an elegant defini definition by Jean Grace, my graduate student, under the unique microclimate created by the forest canopy. But basically, forest farming has to do with growing non-timber forest crops beneath the canopy of an established forest. And uh, there a, lo a lot of things can happen under the northeastern forests. Uh, these non-timber forest products fall into a number of categories, including medicinals, nuts, um, fruits and other food crops, tree syrups, uh, ornamentals, and uh, I think I missed mushrooms right up there. I'd like to start with mushrooms, uh, not only because I'm passionate about them, but also because uh, from the standpoint of advising uh, a woodlot owner, someone's interested in getting involved in, in their forest, it's one of the best bets as far as uh, generating some income in a relatively short period of time. It's a good starter crop. 
we uh, grow shiitake primarily. That's the one that you can kind of count on. But there are a few others that, um, that are possible uh, entries into the commercial world of uh, forest mushrooms. Lion's mane is one. That's this one here. Uh, Oyster mushrooms, pretty common, but they're not very often grown in forest situations. And wine cap stropheria, which is grown on wood chip beds on the ground. And we're really talking about rot and decay. That's what this is all about, which is what makes it so much fun. I want to I wanna give you a, a few case studies today, uh, introduce you to some of the people that really uh, helped us as we went along in writing this book, people who have a practical experience with some of these crops and I actually learned a lot from these folks. Um, these folks are Steve and Julie Rockcastle. They live, uh, it's a little hard to see I think, but they live in the southwest corner of New York State. Uh, and they don't just grow mushrooms. Hardly anyone that grows shiitake mushrooms commercially uh, makes their living entirely from that. In this case, uh, Steve and Julie have an organic farm where they um, have uh, grass-fed beef, also, uh, pasture chickens. They're not shown here, but their eggs are. And a, a couple other crops besides the mushrooms. But these guys have a really unusual source of income. It's called the Great Blue Heron Music Festival. This, they have about 100 acres, most of it woods, and they have the festival out there with about 8,000 people every summer. It's really a blast. Uh, you might want to consider it. So I'm going to use uh, Stephen Julie as a, a vehicle to introduce um, what I consider to be the six stages of shiitake mushroom cultivation. And it really, it applies for any mushroom species that, that grows on wood as a saprophyte. First of all, substrate acquisition. That's a fancy way of saying take your chainsaw out there and cut down live trees. This is Nick Laskowski who uh, graduated from uh, Cornell maybe eight years ago, six or eight years ago. He um, worked with me uh, in the Nut Grove along with Sonam Sherpa. I don't see Sonam here. But anyway, uh, those two guys really contributed a lot to the early development of the site. And uh, he was the one that uh, taught Steve and Julie how to grow mushrooms. So he's cutting down trees for, him, for them. Uh, this is uh, what I call stage two inoculation uh, out in the woods. Uh, inoculation is basically introducing the fungus to the substrate, to the log. And it involves a pretty simple sequence of things. Uh, drilling holes in the log. And then uh, this uh, spawn, as it's called, is injected into the holes. Spawn is simply a, uh, a mixture of sawdust and the vegetative mycelium of the fungus. We're, we're not talking about spores here. Nobody uses spores in shiitake mushroom production. Uh, so this uh, spawn is injected into those holes. And the holes are waxed off uh, to prevent the log from drying out too fast. All right. I'm on number three now. Colonization. Um, you put the, the logs in the laying yard, and they just lay there for about a year. And w what that's all about is the fungus uh, begins the process of decay of the log. It colonizes the log. It takes about a year before a log to become fully colonized by the fungal mycelium. Uh, and in the meantime, it is uh, decaying the log. And white rot fungi like shiitake are really rather unique and kind of amazing because they and few other creatures on the planet Earth can break down uh, the complex co compound lignin. Lignin is the hard part of wood. And it's very difficult, biochemically speaking, uh, to break it down. So they're, they're degrading the wood. Um, and the wood is, is uh, turning into more fungal mycelium, but also it's going into the mushrooms that will emerge later on. And of course, respiration. Uh, through respiration, it's blowing off CO2 and adding water. And that CO2, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's, I don't think it contributes much to global warming. But um, often a, a grower, well, let me say this, that um, Drying of the logs is one of the most serious problems. Uh, more growers fail growing shiitake because they let the logs dry out than any other cause. Uh, so it's interesting that respiration is adding some of that water back. The water is being lost through evaporation. Uh, it's being added through rainfall, sometimes irrigation. And uh, when the mushrooms start coming on, 
water's being lost from that source too. The CO2 loss uh, contributes or, or decreases the uh, dry weight of the log. And it's interesting, some people think, well, I can just lift that log and I know it's lighter than it was last month, and that's true. But the uh, change in weight is not entirely due to evaporation, it's also due to carbon dioxide being blown off into the atmosphere. Well, the next stage, once you've got those logs, uh, you know, I've done it again there. I wanted to say one more thing about this. The fruiting stage, um, that's a great big tank of water, 600 gallons of water, and that's Julie Rockcastle. Um, shiitake's uh, very good in the sense that the grower can uh, determine when to produce the mushrooms, schedule them very precisely for the market, whatever that may be. And the way you do that, once the log is uh, colonized after that first year, it can be placed in water, soaked in water for 24 hours, and that triggers the process of mushroom formation. It takes about a week for the mushrooms to form. So, you, you know, if you have a Saturday's farmer's market about Thursday of the previous week, you can soak the log and pretty reliably have those logs, uh, those mushrooms ready to, uh, to sell at market on Saturday. But of course, uh, once the mushrooms form, you have to harvest them. And Julie's doing that. Um, see the little pocket knife she has there? And that's her basket. So she's cutting off the mushroom stalks and putting them in the basket. But she has that um, knife for another reason. There is a, the most serious pest problem with shiitake mushrooms. It's not bears. It's not deer. It's not poachers. It's slugs. And <laughs> It's, a, it's the bane of every mushroom grower. Slugs are very difficult to manage or to kill. Um, there are all sorts of homey recipes or remedies like wrapping the base of the log in copper or making a, a little circle of diatomaceous earth. None of these things work very well. Even the beer traps don't work all that well. Um, so what Julie does is she goes up there in the evening. I went with her one time. And she's got that little knife. And when she sees the slugs crawling up the log, she cuts them in half with the knife. Um, and it tells me at a busy time of the year, she'll spend two hours a day doing that. It's really brutal, I guess. Uh, nobody's come up with, well, I, I won't say nobody. Um, I was going to say nobody's come up with a good control for slugs, except Steve uh, Gabriel has come up with a really ingenious idea. And I'll show it to you in uh, just a couple of minutes. Can the logs re, re, uh, uh, spore you? No, they're yeah, not, well. Can, can you get multiple harvests? Yes, you can, right. In a given season, you can flush a log three times, and that log will continue to be productive for three years. So it really goes a long way. Now, once you have uh, uh, harvested the logs, you better be selling those mushrooms pretty quick because they only store for about a week. Here's uh, Steve, there's Julie at the uh, farmer's market in Buffalo selling fresh mushrooms. Um, they also have a farm store, which happens to be their, um, their garage in the basement of their house. Uh, and they sell things on a sort of a you pick basis, more or less. Um, customer comes in and takes fresh mushrooms, weighs them out, and then, uh, puts the money in the can. Uh, they can also get fresh eggs from the freezer. They can get uh, frozen. Uh, cuts of beef and so forth. Uh, it, it's a, the honor system because these guys are too busy to uh, be hanging around the, uh, the, the basement all the time or the carport. I meant to show you also, um, I said that the uh, mushrooms don't hang around, fresh mushrooms don't last that long. And you're really kind of limited. Uh, even the season is only about five months long. And after that, you can't be selling fresh mushrooms. But you can be selling value added products um, they, they make uh, several of them at, uh, at their farm. Um, these are dried shiitake mushrooms. There are two ounces of dried mushrooms in there, and uh, they charge $20 for that two ounces. If you hydrate those two ounces back up with the equivalent fresh weight, would be about 14 ounces. So they're actually making uh, $20 on 14 ounces, where if they sell them fresh at the market, they're making $16. Uh, for, for fresh weight. Uh, so they can actually make more on the dry weight basis than the fresh. Um, they, they make a couple of other interesting products like shiitake pate. 
This isn't liver, but it's, it's, a, it's a paste made of uh, shiitake mushrooms, cream, cheese, and hazelnuts. It is to die for. Uh, and then also they, they produce an uh, alcoholic tincture for what ails you. Now, Julia is very meticulous in record keeping, and she keeps uh, track of all her expenses and income. Uh, she's been doing this for quite a few years. Uh, from the first year they started in 2007 all the way up beyond now they're in their 19, uh, 2014 season. But these are their expenses. I've just highlighted uh, sort of the uh, combined expenses in, in, this, uh, in this row. And in this particular year, they don't have any sales. You see that, that column is sales. They don't have any sales to offset the expenses because, as I say, it takes a year uh, for that log to start producing. So in the first year, uh, you're, you're spending a decent amount of money and you're not getting any income. But you do start to get income after that, um, it, it's increasing over time. But the profit, initially, of course, there's, there's uh, some red ink here for two years. They're actually losing money, actually a little bit on the third year, too. After that, they're starting to make money. And by now, they've eliminated this, this, uh, this deficit entirely. But look at these numbers. All this work, and they do a lot of work for a profit of only uh, $1,300, $2,000, $1,500. Um, it's a little per perplexing to me. One of the things is uh, in, the, in the first year, they're not making any mushrooms. But in the second year, they're making uh, some. Um, but not very many, because in their first year they, they used uh, red maple logs, and red maple is not a good substrate, as they have learned and others have learned since then. So they got off to kind of slow start. Since then they've gone over to uh, oak and, and done better. But I put in a, another slide unrelated, well, yeah, unrelated to their place. Um, this is that uh, Northeast Sare project that Don was referring to. And you can see here that uh, we basically we trained uh, 25 people who wanted to learn how to grow shiitake and make money at it. So we took 20 novices and trained them not only in how to grow the mushrooms, you know, that's pretty straightforward, but also uh, taught them some, some enterprise planning skills so that they could uh, intelligently go forth and kind of put this into a, into a business. And then this went on for two years. They kept track and fed us and did data from their expenses, their sales, and their income, everything that was involved, including their labor. And um, you see here, OK, this is uh, pounds per bolt. R recall that Steve and Julie were, were producing about a quarter to a half a pound per bolt. That's a log. Bolt is a log. Uh, whereas most of these folks, particularly the ones that, that made a profit, we're getting upwards of a pound, pound and a half to two pounds of mushrooms. And like I say, I don't really understand why the difference, but it's important to note that <coughs> there can be considerable difference in uh, log production and that can mushroom production from a log, and that can certainly affect the profit. All the, the, the numbers in black here represent farmers, novice farmers that uh, actually made money on the, on the ordeal. And only uh, several did not. They're in the red. But I was impressed that um, 25 people could seriously uh, attempt to uh, learn how to do this and how to make a business of it. And most of them, more than half of them, succeeded at it. So that, I think, is encouraging. Let me introduce you uh, to another mushroom grower. This is Steve Sarek. Um, his place, Hawk Meadow Farm is out in Trumansburg, not far from here. And Steve is one of the most experienced mushroom growers. He's been at it for, I'm not sure, but I know it's in excess of 15 years. He's been doing it for a long time, and he's very experienced and very good at it. Um, like I say, nobody makes all their money on mushrooms. And Steve runs a, uh, uh, a card business. He's a graphic designer, and he sells these uh, sort of nature-related cards. Very, very nice. Um, but as I say, he takes mushroom growing very seriously. This is uh, just some shots of his laying yard right here. Um, Steve is of the opinion that oak is the absolute gold standard for mushroom substrate. Um, he just swears by it. However, he's not 
locked into that. He's the only one I know who has begun to look at uh, bitter nut hickory as a source of shiitake substrate. He's got a lot of that on his land, and uh, he's found that bitter nut hickory can be an effective substrate. It comes on a little later, so that gives him flexibility as far as timing is concerned. Uh, rather than use that tank of water to soak his logs, he has this beautiful stream uh, running right through his property. It runs all year round. And uh, Steve loves to get his feet wet. I mean, I think that's one of the main reasons that he grows shiitake mushrooms. He, he gets out there, that's one of his interns, and he builds these little log rafts um, so that the logs won't float down the stream, and he can keep them in there for 24 hours and put them in the laying yard <laughs> and produce those mushrooms in another week and harvest them. Um, he has uh, hired or he has um, gotten uh, two, well, several, Cornell students had taken the, the uh, forest farming course as interns. This is, uh, this is Ben and uh, this is Hannah. They were both out there this, uh, this summer. It's a real good opportunity. And he's committed to you know, education of young people. Now, like I said, he's, he's well organized. And this is a kind of lousy diagram, but this is the way he scheduled his crops so that he'll have mushrooms just exactly when he needs them. He doesn't sell farmer's market, that sort of thing. He sells to retail, to high-end uh, um, uh, restaurants. And when you have a contract to sell mushrooms to a chef, you better be on time and you better produce the, the numbers that you say you will. So what Steve does is he takes advantage of uh, different spawn types. His spawns are essentially um, these isolates are, spawn, are essentially clones, and the clones have different characteristics. And some of them, like the wide range strains, fruit at a higher temperature, ranging from 55 to 75, whereas other strains called cool weather strains fruit at a lower temperature. So consider the, uh, the main mushroom season from the beginning of May until a little way into October. Um, he'll take his whole whole laying yard full of mushrooms and divide it into seven groups. Each group here is represented by a stack of logs, but groups are actually larger than that. But at any rate, he will take uh, the first group and soak it on um, the first day of, of this uh, sequence of weeks in the beginning of May. Um, he'll, he'll soak it, he'll take it out, harvest the mushrooms, and put that log back in the laying yard. Then he'll take the second stack soak it, laying, laying yarn, put it back, uh, third stack, third week, and all the way until he's covered uh, all seven stacks in seven weeks. And that's convenient because a log has to rest between the time it's fruited and it, and it uh, produces mushrooms again. It needs about a seven week resting period. So by the time all seven stacks are completed, he's ready to start with the first stack again, and that's the, uh, the pink ones here. They'll go through another seven week sequence, and even uh, if the weather cooperates, he'll get a third flush, as it were. So when you look at the numbers, these are just rough numbers, if you're getting half a pound per flush, and often Steve is getting better than that, uh, three flushes per year for three years, and uh, selling at $12 a pound, and that, that log is worth more than $50. That's a little bit more than you'd get from that log as firewood. So uh, there is some potential to make money there. Yeah, OK, I, I also wanted to mention the use of those different strains to, to uh, advantage as far as scheduling is concerned. The cool weather strains, they fruit early in the season when it's too cool for the warm weather strains to fruit. So he's getting uh, a total of uh, about two months extra production time when the, in the spring before the others would come on. And those same logs, cool weather logs, will fruit again in the fall when it gets cool. So he's really almost doubled his, uh, his season through these uh, strategies for season extension. And how much of the spawn do they have to put per hole? I mean, do they just take a piece and stuff it in there? Well, it, there remember, it's, it's uh, sawdust kind of uh, integrated with the yeah. mycelium. And you're putting about um, two cubic centimeters in that hole. Um, is there a tool to do that, or did they yeah. just sort of? See, she's holding that tool right there. She's uh, plunged that uh, sort of an uh, injector into the sawdust, uh, set it over the hole, and it just forces it down. 
and it just sends the plug of uh, spawn right into the hole. One of those uh, bags of spawn can inoculate about uh, 30 logs, and the bag costs about $25. So the cost of uh, the mushroom spawn per log is really quite reasonable. A couple of uh, issues that are going to affect the, the future of mushroom cultivation, forest mushroom cultivation. One, um, we hope, and, and some of the growers are trying out new strains, like the lion's mane and the scrofaria and so forth. Um, insurance is something you might not expect, but we've been surprised to see that there have been quite a few um, farmers who have been denied or canceled their farm insurance because they're growing mushrooms. And these insurance companies, the agents, they're, you know, they're supposed to be experts at risk assessment. Uh, this is what they're wor worried about. Poison mushrooms, you know, you might eat them instead of shiitake and die. But the chance of uh, coming across a poison mushroom on a mushroom log uh, are, are just about nil. This is gallerina, it's poisonous, but it only uh, affects logs that are far uh, more rotten, just falling apart compared to the shiitake log when it's in its prime or even when it's been thrown away. Um, so it looks very different, it's smaller, and if you know what you're doing at all, uh, there's really z very, very low probability that you're going to uh, poison somewhere. We always say that the risk of the farmer cutting his leg off with a chainsaw is quite a bit higher than uh, poisoning one of his customers, his or her. Oh, I, I, I did mention um, slug control er earlier. This is a de depiction of Steve Gabriel's uh, forest farm called um, uh, Spring Meadow Forest Farm and uh, in, in, out in Mecklenburg. And you can see, you know, this is Carl Whitaker made this drawing. There's the log with a lot of mushrooms on it. And these nasty slugs are climbing all over the log and they're eating those mushrooms. But the ducks come to save the day. Steve has actually introduced ducks into his laying yard, and they keep the slugs uh, pretty much under control. Never heard of anybody doing that, but it's, it's a really a clever idea. And I guess it really works. Uh, now let me shift gears and talk to you a little bit about uh, forest farming of medicinal herbs. Um, we're talking, well, the most prominent one, the one in everyone's almost everyone is familiar with, is American ginseng. Very valuable, and I'll talk more about it. But there are a number of others that are used as medicinal herbs, one way or another. Um, not just these five, but quite a few others. Fairy wand, black cohosh, blue cohosh, snake root, golden seal. Uh, but the one to really launch into, you know, whenever, whenever we get um, questions about, uh, you know, can I start uh, forest farming, I want to grow ginseng, uh, the answer isn't always yes, depending on conditions. But there are basically four different ways to make money uh, growing medicinal herbs. One is to collect them from the wild, and a lot of that is done. Um, another is to grow these herbs in a forest garden or a forest farm um, and harvest the, uh, the root, for example, for the medicinal organ, as I call it, the root or the rhizome or the leaves or whatever, um, that's the product that, that the, uh, the buyer is looking for. Or uh, a forest farmer can specialize in producing um, propagules, planting stock, produce seeds, or produce, uh, in the case of ginseng, these are called rootlets. They're just two-year-old seedlings. And they're worth about $2 a piece. Um, and a, a beginning grower can get like a three-year head start by using those. Because the seed, uh, to go from seed to a finished uh, root it can take um, eight to ten years, uh, depending on how you grow it. Then finally, uh, the last one here is uh, medicinal ornamentals. Um, you don't normally think of medicinal herbs as being ornamental, but um, you see American ginseng here. When it's in these red berries, it's quite attractive. Um, other things like blue co or black cohosh, just elegant looking flowers and they do quite well in a shade garden. Um, now as far as ginseng is concerned, it's a, a very interesting crop uh, because the price that a grower can get or a grower collected, 
collector can get is sort of inversely proportional to how intensive it is to grow the crop. Um, wild collected ginseng <coughs> is not intensive at all. Uh, the collector goes out in the woods and collects the ginseng, doesn't have to manage the crop beforehand at all. That's worth $600 a pound. Most American ginseng is sold to Asian buyers, to Hong Kong in particular, and the demand from gin for ginseng in, in, in Asian countries is very high, almost insatiable. So you have these amazingly high prices uh, for ginseng on a dry weight basis. Um, wild simulated ginseng, you go into the woods with a handful of seeds and you scatter them around and come back eight years later and there you have it. Uh, and if you've been, if, if everything has worked out, you know, there are a lot of problems, but if everything work, works out, you can have that uh, uh, ginseng ready to harvest in about eight years, eight to ten years. And you, since it looks identical to wild ginseng, you really can't tell the difference. It's worth just as much, $600 a pound. Then there's woods cultivated ginseng. This is the kind of thing you see in a lot of forest farming situations, including the McDaniels nut grove. Basically raised beds uh, where <coughs> ginseng is planted and managed moderately intensively. Um, There'll be some weeding and some cultivating and, and perhaps some use of fungicides and so forth. So it's moderately intensive, and yet the price is half of what wild ginseng is. And then in the lower right here, this is a ginseng grown under artificial shade. This is the way they do it in Wisconsin and Ontario. Uh, they have these vast structures of, uh, sh covered with shade cloth. It's very expensive to build them and you can only use them once after you've harvested that crop you have to move on to a different piece of land uh, planted at incredibly high densities requires the use of lots of fungicide to keep alternaria and phytophthora in check so uh, after all that work um, you're only getting thirty dollars a pound um, what, what you, you can produce a root instead of uh, eight or ten years you can produce a root in three or four years but it looks like a carrot and has none of the char character that a wild root has there. Note the uh, resemblance to a person. First uh, ginseng grower I want to introduce you to is uh, Bruce Fetaplace. Uh, Bruce lives in uh, somewhere near Norwich, New York. He won't tell you exactly well be where because you'd go out and steal his ginseng. Um, but anyway, uh, Bruce, he doesn't look that dour all the time. He's a nice, <laughs> <laughs> he's a really nice guy. But look at what, what he's up to. Uh, he's a buyer of wild furs, ginseng, deer hides, horns, a uh, full line of trapping supplies. I even went out there and he was selling castor glands from beavers, which mountain men used to use as a, as a, as a lure for trapping beavers. That's amazing. So he's as close as anyone I know to a true mountain man. And uh, there he is standing on one of his um, woods cultivated beds. Now, uh, Bruce is a, a kind of a clever businessman. Uh, he can make money several different ways. He is a buyer, well, he collects wild ginseng, but he also buys wild ginseng from other collectors, and then he sells it to buyers in New York City and so forth, and he makes a good amount of money right there. Um, he cultivates some ginseng like uh, this uh, woods, Woods, woods garden right here that he's been growing for quite a while. Um, and like I say, if, if he does it right, he can get, well, 300 to $600 a pound, depending on how he does it. Um, but he also sells seeds, and the seeds are really rather expensive because they have a two-year dormancy, have to be pre-stratified before you sell them. And uh, a pound of those seeds cost about $150. And then finally, as I mentioned before, these are the ginseng seedlings or rootlets that uh, he sells in some quantity. Now, the one on the bottom I, I call Bruce's retirement account uh, because it's really a pretty amazing story. Bruce, uh, you know, he plants ginseng every year. He has about seven acres that he's planting ginseng on, and he hardly ever pl uh, harvests any. He started planting about 30 years ago. And most of it uh, until a couple of years ago was still in the ground. He let these things get bigger and bigger um, until they, they look something like this. Uh, it's called man root, not just because it looks like the Pillberry Doughboy, but because it also is uh, anatomically correct, if you know what I mean. Uh, 
the more so, the more valuable it is. And uh, the house that Ginseng built, I really wish I had taken pictures of his house, but I didn't. Uh, his house is amazing. He built it by hand. And the way ginseng relates to it is um, he had all this ginseng in the ground for you know, some of it 30 years old. And I guess uh, the rodenticide label uh, was, was uh, taken away, so he didn't have access to a good rodenticide against uh, mice and voles. And so they started ravaging his crop. He was losing lots and lots of ginseng to these mice and voles, so he had not, no choice. He went and dug it all at one time. He sold it for $150,000, and he tells me that if, he, if the mice hadn't got most of it, he would have made at least a quarter million dollars. But um, so he used this money to build this amazing house. Now you might be saying that, well, you can't build that much of a house for $150,000. But uh, Bruce took care of everything. He has 100 acres of trees. Uh, he did the logging. He did the milling into lumber. Um, he is an experienced carpenter, and so he, he built the house from the ground up, and he's a really elegant finished carpenter. That's just uh, looking out his uh, living room window in a, um, a, a glass representation of ginseng right there. Talk a little bit about minor medicinals, which is practically everything besides ginseng. Although um, golden seal is worth, um, whereas ginseng is $600 a pound, golden seal is about $60 a pound. But that's better than, than most of these. Um, black cohosh, for example, is a uh, so-called women's herb. And uh, a collector, someone who's collecting it from the wild or growing it in a garden, can get about $3 a pound for the dried root. Um, and it's just hardly worth the trouble of growing it for five years if you're only going to get $3, $3 a pound. So there are ways around that. Um, Beth root, or as we know it, trillium. Uh, fairy wand is an interesting crop. And uh, blood root, too. Dave Carmen is a... Uh, a retired uh, telephone executive who lives in um, West Virginia, and he specializes in growing not so much the roots of the organ of, of medicinal interest, but rather uh, planting stock for other people. This is about a, I don't know, quarter acre or so. It's just part of his overall garden. And he tells me that in this block, he has about 30 different plants. Uh, and it just looks like a random mix, but I think Dave knows where every single plant is. There are about six different plants represented right here in this uh, roughly a square meter. He's also developing a steep hillside with terraces, and uh, he just enjoys doing this and has time to do it and makes some money at it, too. Um, one of his favorite crops, most, uh, most valued crops, is fairy wand. Beautiful flower there, isn't it? Um, so he starts this uh, in a little small seed bed, grows the plants for, I think, several months to a year, pricks them out, transfers them to a raised bed, and then after a couple more years, he transfers them, transplants them out into the garden, in, into, into the soil. Doesn't use containers. Um, and after a total of six years, the plant is ready to be dug. Now, um, Dave is a pretty small, light guy, so he really has to wail on that shovel to get it down where the roots are. And so he's digging it out of the ground there. And, well, that's him doing it again, but he'll take one of these big fibrous root systems, about like that, from a six-year-old plant, and he'll divide it into several pieces with a shoot associated with each one, uh, put it in a plastic bag with sphagnum moss, and ship that out to buyers, to people who want it. Uh, but he does a couple of other money-making things with the same crop. Uh, he, coll he collects and sells seed, and the seeds are, are shatter uh, from the inflorescence. When they're ripe, they'll just drop to the ground and pretty much be lost. And so he'll put these little bags, mesh bags, over them to uh, prevent the seeds from getting lost. And then because fairy wand is worth si about $60 a pound dry root, um, he will uh, actually sell some of it that way, too. One other crop that he grows that he's really proud of is uh, Virginia snake root. It's an interesting plant. It's not particularly ornamental, uh, and it doesn't grow around here as far as I know, but it's further south of here. 
um, the flower, well, the seed is valuable. And the flower is uh, very small. It's right down here at ground level underneath the leaves. And w once it matures and sets seed, um, the seeds just fall and you, you've lost them once again. So he has this really clever mechanism for collecting the seeds. Um, here's a flower stalk. Well, there's one right there coming from the crown of the plant. And he has these aluminum vials with a uh, transparent lid. Takes it apart, and he's got a slot in the in the uh, aluminum vial. He sets the the, the uh, stalk, the flower stalk, right into that that groove, and the flower is now inside the vial. Caps it off, and it's already been pollinated in after whatever period of time I don't know. Uh, the seeds drop right into the vial. Now I've never seen anyone do anything like that, but that way he he collects the seeds at a dollar a piece, and uh, he also lines some of the uh, snake root out in a transplant bed and sells some of it that way too. Here's Amer American ginseng again at Dave's place, Dave Carmen. Um, he doesn't dig any root at all. He doesn't have any voles, I guess. Um, but what he does is he grows the plant, and this is a very old plant for seed. And Bruce doesn't do this, Bruce Pettick place, but he finds it necessary to cover this, the uh, seed heads with these mesh bags and collect the seed that way. And uh, as I say, uh, the seeds are worth $150 a pound, so it seems to be worthwhile. <coughs> okay, here's the last one I wanted to talk about. Um, <coughs> well, actually, we're pretty much at, uh, up to time, right? No, we Okay, um, I wanted to talk about one other um, couple that do forest farming. Um, this is Dave and Diane Cornman. This is very confusing because they're both Dave, and then the spelling of the name is practically the same, but this is Cornman and the other one was Carmen. Whatever. Um, these guys have a really beautiful nursery in the woods. It's just immaculate, and it's a pleasure to go there just walking through it. This is just a shot from their website. And here's uh, typical raised beds within their nursery. They're very, very uh, prolific, and they built these two uh, beautiful little outhouses. Uh, not outhouses, small, <laughs> <laughs> small outbuildings, that's what I meant to say. Uh, and this looks a little sloppy, but um, this is, uh, they actually specialize in trilliums. And this is right after the trillium crop was pretty much finished and dug and so forth. It looks a little trashy. Um, but the next slide you can see more typical, well-ordered forest nursery. Some plants are in these raised beds in, in, in a compost mixture, and others are being grown in containers over there. Um, I mentioned before bloodroot. Uh, black cohosh, excuse me, black cohosh. It is just a gorgeous plant. We have some around here. I don't see it too often, but when it's in bloom, it's just uh, very impressive. And, pardon me? What's Actea? Um, Actea, Ray Samosa? Yeah, it changed. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so he grows it in containers, and he sells those containers for about $20 a piece. And remember, the root is only worth $3 a pound. So this is really a value-added sort of approach. Um, this is a bed of, of his uh, Actea, or black cohosh. And this thing isn't medicinal at all, but uh, you probably recognize the yellow sl lady slipper, Cypripedium. Um, he's one of the few people I've seen who actually grow Cypripediums and sell them for a phenomenal price. Um, it is illegal to di dig wild cypripediums, and if you collect seed from your own, scatter it around, forget it. No germination at all, because they have a very tight symbiosis with a particular type of fungus. So you really can't grow it from seed yourself. The only uh, way you can get it reliably is to have it grown in tissue culture uh, at a specialized lab like Spangle Creek Labs up in Wisconsin. Um, Dave buys the seedlings from uh, Spangle Creek and gets them out into the, uh, the raised bed and grows them on. You can even see here, 
thought you could see some flower heads. Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, these aren't far from flowering. And he'll sell one flowering plant. It takes about, I think, about three years to get there for $60 a plant. Whoa. Yeah. Oh. Time's up. OK, well, ginseng too. Um, aquatic plants. And that's all I have to say. some forest farmers to start growing cannabis? Well, not so many, you know, because it really requires high levels. Mm. Well, I guess people grow it for us, but you can't get production in the shape. How would I? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Right. Yeah, can you have mentioned the difference between uh, forest gardening and forest farming? And what is that difference? Well, forest farming is starting to grow non timber forest crops beneath the canopy of an established forest. Forest gardening is starting from scratch and basically growing a forest using uh, forest ecological principles and so A forest of edible plants and use to things. So bottom up, top down. Mm. Emily. Um, yeah, do, do mushroom growers ever find it, or uh, ever produce their own spawn after a few years, or is it always more economical to produce? Well, as far as shiitake is concerned, some people do it, for instance, because they're like fanatic and stuff, because they really enjoy being in the lab. But at $25 for 30 logs, really high quality spawn, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're interested in uh, cultivating lion's mane uh, or oyster and stuff, you can go out into the woods, harvest plants, uh, get them into culture, and make them own spawn. And a few people do that. We do that as part of the research practice. Uh, when you talk about slugs attacking uh, mushroom crops, are you, uh, at least in this part of the country, is the main problematic one the uh, big invasive leopard slug? No, the, the slugs that I see on mushrooms are little tiny okay. things, and I don't know what they're named. They're not the big guys. Can you just ask Geneva family questions? Oh, yeah, Geneva. One, two people? Okay. Any questions? Apparently not. Okay, okay Ken, thank you so much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.